I am John Lark Larkowski. I'm more nervous than I thought I would be. Uh, I'm a developer for HashRocket, which contrary to proper opinion, is uh, it's not a drug cartel that deals to nerds in space. <laughs> uh, just like Jim, I'm going to rename my talk right now. Uh, testing talks, money walks. I don't know what that means, but it rhymes. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I'm going to try not to blow into my mic, but uh, the whole point of, of this conference is competitive edge. So I'm going to say what we do at HashRocket. Uh, it's actually a subset. Of, if you've seen Obi's talk on the HashRocket way, this is a smaller subset uh, relating to how we do testing. I'm going to go over each one of our tools and techniques, and I'm going to say how they support uh, communication, because this is still the, uh, pretty similar to the talk that I gave last November at uh, the Pro Ruby conference in Boston. And I'm going to say how every one of our Agile tools and techniques actually will save you time and money. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the future where I think we're headed with testing and more like testing interface points, in, uh, integration testing. All right, so are we good? It's buzzing pretty bad. I can, I can unplug it for now. Is that good? Yeah. Sounds better. <laughs> Was it OK? Did you say we could leave? Yeah, just plug it in when you're ready. Oh, okay, sure. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so two of our values at HashRocket are agility and transparency, and we support those uh, but with testing and communication. Testing allows you to be agile, communication allows you to be transparent. And all this saves you time and money, ideally. And that's the HashRocket way. All right, that's the end of the sales pitch, I promise. All right, so we test all the fucking time at HashRocket. Is Brian here? Brian Lyles? Props to you, man. Uh, we, uh, and if we test all the time, and if testing is communication, then we communicate all the fucking time. So uh, the way that we, uh, only if we keep the overhead low, by the way. You don't want to communicate to the point where you're wasting time on it. So I'm going to tell you how our, our tools uh, actually communicate with low overhead. Okay, so there's three lines of communication I'm going to talk about with every one of our tools and techniques. There's client to developer, there's developer to developer, and finally, there's uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm not going to cover that in this talk. <laughs> Cheap humor. Can't resist it. All right, I'm also going to talk about fiscal responsibility in these tough times. Uh, fiscal responsibility relates to competitive edge. So testing is communication, and we're baking in both testing and communication to our agile process at HashRocket, and we're trying to keep it with low overhead, so it doesn't take you that much overhead to test. It doesn't take you that much overhead to communicate. And this saves you dough, ideally. Without further ado, let's walk through the process. Our uh, first tool that we use is Pivotal Tracker. We live in it. Is anybody out there using it? Yeah, yeah give it up for Pivotal Tracker. All right, there's a few of you using We've been using it so long, I don't even know if you can see that screenshot. That's old school Pivotal Tracker. That's like, it's like from six months ago. It's ancient. <laughs> Uh, we don't write code unless it's for a story. We don't type on the keyboard unless we've clicked start on a story in Pivotal Tracker. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on some screenshots here. Come on, buddy. Here's a screenshot of Pivotal Tracker. I really wish I had that laser pointer if someone wants to loan me one. Uh, you can get kind of an overview of all your projects at the top, and you see we have all these different uh, swim lanes. We got like our current iteration that we're working on, and uh, the backlog and stuff we will be working on. The stories run down the left-hand side there in priority order. Uh, we also have some, you can't really see that well. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, but the stories have stars, and like development chores have little gears. Here's a little bit more detail on one of the actual stories. And again, I'm sorry it's small. I can't even do the little zoom trick with the control. That doesn't work. Uh, but you can see we have our, our text of our story written down at the bottom there. And we assign points to our stories and yada, yada, yada. This is really the only thing that I've liked better than note cards ever. And it's, it's I don't know, I couldn't imagine uh, developing without it for client work. So the communication aspect supported by a Pivotal Tracker, uh, transparency and scheduling from the, from the client to the developer, they see the same thing we see, and they say it in real time. As soon as we change a story, they see the change in the story. As soon as they write a new story, it pops right in, we see it instantaneously. Uh, for developer to developer, we use the tools uh, for uh, estimation. And you know who's working on what right now? If we're on a project that has like four developers, we need to know what the other pair of developers is doing. 
Pretty cool, huh? All right, so the physical aspects of Pivotal Tracker. Uh, it, again, allows for that real-time web collaboration, which is going to lower that overhead. You're not doing anything separate. Like, I'm already developing. I'm, I need to click that story to start my coding. So as soon as I click start, I've already communicated to my client, hey, this is what I'm working on right now. You want to know what I'm up to? That's what I'm up to. And also, you know, if, if you're working with someone who's on the other side of the office, they say, oh, he clicked start on that story. I'm not going to pick up that story card. Uh, the other parts, I didn't show you any screenshots of this, but Pivotal has some pretty nice uh, reporting tools and uh, tools for projection, like burn down charts, and are you going to make your release, yada, yada, yada. So the, uh, I say yada, yada, yada way too much, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's all based off real world data, so it's actually tracking what you've done over the last three weeks, and they can tell you what your velocity is. It's pretty nice. So that's Tracker, but Tracker at its core is all about stories. Is everyone here familiar enough with, with Agile and knows what a, what a story is? A story is just, uh, it's like a tiny, tiny use case. It's the, the minimum testable use case. And really, stories, if you think about it, they are tests themselves, as expressed by the customer, because they contain acceptance criteria. The customer is going to tell you, look, I'm not going to accept this story unless it does these three things, these three bullet points that I put on the story. So the communication aspects facilitated by using stories, they're tokens of a conversation. Don't ever forget that, that some developer talked to some client probably for 20 minutes and argued and hashed it out and then finally came to something they thought they could agree on. And that story is your mini, mini, min, miniature contract for that. And uh, for you developers out there, always make sure to write stories at a level that you could actually implement. You could pick up that story and actually start developing against it. Don't just say, log in. I can't really develop login. I would say, you know, bring up a sign-in form that captures email and password. And if there's a failure, yada yada, you know, I did yada yada again. I'm sorry about that. Put a quarter in the yada yada jar. All right. So some techniques we use around stories. We don't actually use story cards. We actually capture them directly into Tracker with the client. A lot of times we'll sit with them around a conference table and we will type the stories together. That's very important. You get that uh, translation. Sorry, uh, you get the translation from. What does the customer think in their head, and how do they express it, and then how do you express it you know, as in your geek speak, and you meet in the middle, so you can express something they express in English to something that a, uh, like a developer could read. We also use standard forms. We always try to capture our stories with in order to, as a, I want to. So in order to do something of business value, as a user, I want to sign in. So the reason we put in order to first it's because I can't tell you the number of stories I've tried to write where you'll be with a client and you'll say, um, as a user, I want to view some widget. And then you just ask them, why do you want to view that widget? And they're like, well, actually, there's no need to view that widget right here. There's no business you know, taking place on that widget. The other thing we do, and I'll get into this later, is we do given wins and thens. We're actually doing a lot of uh, automated testing. And that, that's the end of my talk, though. I don't want to get this at now. But that's given is your precondition, when is your action, and then is your postcondition. And again, we do write those with a developer sitting right there. So our stories are always written at a level a developer can implement. Fiscal aspects of using stories. Well, you get the same benefits. If you believe in the agile processes, you're going to believe in the value of stories. And those are the typical things you want to deliver early and often, using just enough, enough stories that deliver you know, the 1.0 of your app, like Rob was just saying. You know, how many stories does it take to get to 1.0? Well, a handful for two weeks. Uh, constant cost of change. Every story costs about the same, or you could move a story later, and it would still cost about the mu as much to uh, implement it. Tight response to change. You can reprioritize those stories. If you remember in the uh, screenshot, you can actually slide any one of those rows around, so the customer could drag and drop those anywhere they wanted to. And you can recoup at any time, ideally, with Agile. You could stop right there. You have a deliverable system at the end of every story, as long as the stories aren't dependent on each other. So that's stories. Now, when we actually start coding stories, <coughs> we pair all the fucking time. Thank you. And thanks to uh, Tam or Sala from ThoughtBot. That we were actually coding there. That was not staged. <laughs> Sorry. All right, communication aspects of pair programming. Uh, who's pairing, by the way? Who's pairing some of the time? Who's pairing most of the time? Anyone pairing all the fucking time? All right, a few hands. We'll get there. We'll get there together. 
Uh, hopefully you know the benefits already. Uh, for me, just developer to developer, it keeps me focused, keeps me honest, keeps me writing tests, hopefully writing tests first, keeps my code to a high quality. You've got continuous code review going on. You've got continuous design review. Um, then in terms of if you've got to talk as a developer to your client, you've got redundancy. There's this notion of bus sensitivity where we all have one dude in the organization who, if he was hit by a bus, all the institutional knowledge would die with him and the projects would fail and people would sue you. So on every project we have two people that know something about that project and can keep that continuity going if someone's sick or on vacation or you want to you know, put someone else on the project. Actual pair programming techniques we use, uh, two developers, one screen. We actually have uh, two keyboards plugged into the same screen, so you're not fighting over the keyboard to see who drives. Anyone can drive. I see a few people get the joke. Thank you. Uh, anyone can drive when they want to drive. They don't have to wait and pull the keyboard away from the other person. And we also do ping pong. Ping ponging is the notion of one developer starts and he will write a failing test. The other developer then will drive and they will write code to make that test pass. And then they write a failing test themselves, so then it goes back to the first developer to make that one pass. And the reason we do that is it keeps everyone invested. You really care. You're like, I'm going to write this test. There's no way you can make that pass, dude. And you're like, oh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to make that shit pass. <laughs> and then it just keeps going like that. We find it's, it really keeps buying because you're vested. You've got some skin in the game. You, know, you, you want to make that pass. Whereas if one dude is just being aggro and, and typing all the time, the other guy tunes out, looks at his iPhone, whatever. We also do play a lot of ping pong, the real game. Daily stand-ups are another thing we do. We do these stand-ups both intra-project and for our whole company. So often we'll just have two, two guys uh, on a project or two gals. And uh, sometimes we have a team of four, though. But we're always talking to our clients at least once a day. But then we meet as a whole team, our whole company. And then we'll bring up something interesting that happened. It's not as detailed as the project stand-up, but it's a good way to keep your whole company in sync. And we do take ping pong very seriously at Hash Rocket. We just moved to a new office, and we haven't moved our table in like two weeks, so I'm starting to get the shakes from, from not playing ping pong. And then this is just an example of one of our stand-ups where our whole company is around just you know, saying what happened yesterday, what's going to happen today, and any trouble, or if you came up with something cool yesterday. Oh, boy. I'm sure you've all fought the fight with management at some point over... Uh, over pair programming. I actually almost got fired myself for uh, trying to implement it in a government bureaucratic button-up situation. But then three years later, they came back and said, oh, you can pair now. It's like, too late. So I can tell you that studies show that pair programming is actually more productive. And I actually do believe it's more productive because you get this thing called pair flow where the whole world is tuned out and no one wants to interrupt a pair and you're going and you're ping-ponging back and forth and you get in that zone a lot quicker than you would get in the zone yourself because you're continually pulled into the zone by the guy next to you. Um, I don't know, we can argue about it later over free cocktails from, from New Relic, but I'd like to argue with anyone who thinks that pair programming doesn't actually make you a better programmer because you're leveling up or a faster programmer doing more than you could do on your own. Or I could tell you just to go do it Try pair programming, get in trouble, get almost fired for it, but try to actually do it because there's no better way. I can't imagine doing it without it. So seriously, do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mari Finkel and uh, Owen Wilson pairing in Starsky and Hutch. See, even they were a pair. All right, let's get back into testing here. The communication aspects facilitated by testing. Well, your customer is going to express tests to you in the form of acceptance criteria or stories, and it's up to you as a geek to translate those into MVC tests or possibly integration tests at a higher level. Uh, as a developer, in an easy, low overhead way, you can communicate back to your customer with what's known as the RSpec spec doc format, or you could use Cucumber, which is uh, English language tests. And I'm going to show you details of these in a little bit here. Uh, one small point, as, as far as communicating to developers, you could make the argument that the business rules change a lot slower than the coding rules, or New technologies come along every couple of years that could implement your stuff faster. Maybe you want to switch your app from a Rails app to a Sinatra app, or you know, maybe Erlang on Rails, or whatever's going to come out next. You know, you know, Java on Struts on Rails 4, Merb 2. Um, 
uh, so, but if you've, if, you've used, if you've written these specs in English in your code and expressed at the geeky English level what you want your system to do, if you've expressed your API at that level or at the integration level, that's going to live on. That's something someone could actually use if they came along to rewrite your system, which they will in a few years. But let's look at a couple examples. Again, sorry, I can't zoom in, so I'm going to read these to you. This is uh, some output from the Cucumber program. Cucumber is uh, integration level testing, and that uh, integrates with uh, WebRat or Selenium, and it integrates with RSpec. So every one of these, uh, <clears throat> Every one of these things in white here is a story. They call them features. Uh, and you can say, like, at the top, as a shopper, I want to activate my account from the sign-up email so I can start using the site. That doesn't actually run, but the stuff in green is all attached to running code. Every one of those uh, green lines maps to an actual bit of running code in the back end. So you can define a scenario saying, uh, given a filled out sign up form, when I press sign up and I follow the link in the email, then I should be logged in and I should be at the home page. So that's English. That's something everyone can understand. That's, that's something you know you can get at from any side. And uh, those parameters, if you see they're underlined here and there, you'll see underlined phrases there. Those will actually all become parameters to back end uh, functions. And those are in gray, which you really can't see. I'm sorry. But those actually reference the line of code that's going to run as a result of you just writing something in English. And we'll, we'll come back to this later, too. And here's just a simple example of this is the RSpec spec doc output. So every one of these green lines actually has an RSpec example beneath it. And so this is the English explanation of what a few lines of code in an RSpec example is. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll read you a little bit of the lowest one, like user editing. It is not editable if not logged in. It's not editable by a stranger. It's editable by itself. I mean, that's something that's durable that can last forever, regardless of, of what language you're implementing in. Here are some of the actual techniques we use to test at HashRocket. Just a few. Uh, we do use RSpec, although we keep having the argument over whether it's RSpec or shoulda or test unit. Uh, by the way, Joe Ferris just did a patch that lets you use any, R, uh, any shoulda macros in RSpec, which is pretty cool. So that might end that argument, at least at the high level. Uh, we do model and view controller tests. And yes, we do do view testing. Is anyone doing view testing, like religiously, besides Brian and a couple other guys? Nice. Yeah, we do actually do that and argue with you uh, about view testing. We, we do it in a very sane way. We're testing for if you've got an if in your view, you want to see positive and negative. Or if you have an error in your view, you want to make sure that that error shows up for error conditions. And there's smart ways that you can, in a non-brittle fashion, test your views. Uh, no fixtures. No fixtures at all. Uh, we, we use Factory Girl or Object Daddy. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we're also uh, using Cucumber more and more. We got in a couple projects. Cucumber is the modern incarnation of Story Runner, which we were trying a little bit last year. But uh, the whole point of this talk is to motivate yourselves and me to start testing at more of an integration level, more of an interface level. But, and again, we'll come back to that. We're using Selenium to drive the browser. Uh, Selenium actually will take control of your Firefox and click the buttons for you, and it'll run Ajax, and you can make assertions based on that. Uh, we're running a tool called RSpector. I don't know if you know about it. It's basically auto test, but for RSpec. And there's some Mac OS X version of it right now that I haven't used yet, but it looks, looks pretty hot. We do do continuous integration. We're using uh, Integrity to uh, run our builds, if anyone knows about Integrity. And uh, we also click on stuff. You'd be, <laughs> you'd be surprised. You have a developer who's like, of course my code works. I'm just going to deliver it to the customer. Well, did you click on it on the staging server? Because it don't work. So we actually do uh, try to click on, click on the stuff that we just developed before we tell the customer about it. Who's heard we don't have time to test? We're on a deadline. Yeah, most of us. All right, we'll quit that job immediately. <laughs> Unless it's Obi Fernandez <laughs> who says, hi, Obi. See you on the Con Freaks uh, video. <laughs> you don't have time not to test. Uh, I really believe that. And again, if you've got a company that won't let you test, try to get fired for testing if you can. 
because it's good for the company. It lets you respond to change quickly. You can be very daring in your refactorings. If you've got a test suite, especially if you have it at a higher level, this comes from like Yehuda's talk about testing interface points. If you've tested all of your interface points, you can totally gut your system and redo it, and it still pretty much does what it used to do. And for us uh, in web apps, that means testing things at the browser level. Less regression, no rework. I hate managers who say, I don't want to do rework. Well, what the hell does that mean? But you won't ever have to do rework because you won't, your, your old bugs uh, will come right to the fore. Uh, again, it supports collective ownership, guards against misuse. How many of you have written some beautiful code and then worried about your little baby going off to the, to the handoff team or going off to some external client and you don't know what's going to happen to it when it grows up? Well, as long as they don't muck with your tests, hopefully they can still keep that code running beautifully. And again, uh, serves in as built-in documentation as I showed you all that green text before. And you get that for free almost. It's low overhead. The developer's writing five lines of code. You can write one line of a comment that describes that test semantically in English. And it's, I know comments are fiction, but those are less likely to be fiction. And it supports continuous integration and delivery, deliverability, and we deliver all the fucking time. Catching a, a theme here. We deliver uh, finished stories multiple times a day, and w this allows for a very tight feedback. We do have clients who we're in Tracker and we'll click the finish button, we'll click the deliver button, we get that story out in the staging server, they'll accept it within two minutes. Like, we can't keep up with our clients. It's almost like they accept the story before we finished it. And I mean, you can't, you can't buy feedback like that. It's terrific, and it's good for the client too because it allows them to be very agile. Uh, and one thing we do do, Especially if we have like a team of four working on something, you'll have, uh, you might know that the other pair has picked up a card and did it, but you don't really know what it looks like. So we have delivery parties, like at the end of the day, we'll get together and we'll say, dude, check this out, I did this feature, and click on this and click on that. And so you're actually clicking on the feature, you've got uh, you know, two more sets of eyes on it before you send it off to the customer. Techniques we use for continuous delivery, the usual, we use Capistrano, Cap Deploy. Uh, we uh, will only deploy if our build server passes, if everything's green. And we often deploy to Engine Yard. We try to pass everyone off to Engine Yard if you can. Uh, there's, there's no point in hiring a system administrator if you can help it. We also will, though, if a client uh, doesn't want to go with Engine Yard, we, we usually will have a public staging server on an Amazon EC2 instance. Physical aspects of continuous delivery. It's all about responding to the market, recouping your investment at any time. Again, these are all the Agile principles. This is why people do Agile. This is how Agile is sold, extreme programming, whatever. Um, you know, if they run out of money or they want to do something better with their money, they can hopefully, you just finish the story, everything passes, everything's green, they can take their money and go and try to you know, recoup their investment in the market immediately. <clears throat> so once we've delivered, this is the acceptance phase. I just wanted to cover it explicitly. This is when the client is actually going over the story that you wrote with them together, and this is sort of the final test. They have to tell you that we accept it. It's sort of like a miniature contract. You know, They give you cash, they want code, and they want that code to run. So they tell you if you're doing it wrong, or they tell you if you're doing it right, and sometimes you are doing it wrong. <laughs> I put these up so I can take a drink of water, collect my thoughts. <clears throat> Hopefully you're doing it right with testing. Uh, techniques we use for client acceptance, we actually, as a developer, will sit with the client ideally in person and accept with them and click through the site with them because if something does mess up, they can tell us right away and we can take some notes. Uh, absent that, we can actually, we prefer to video chat with our clients anytime we do a meeting, very visceral, face-to-face makes us happier, makes them happier. It's hard to get angry at someone if you can actually you know, see their face. And we also, again, do the daily stand-up with our clients. Fiscal aspects of client acceptance. You can verify you got what you paid for, and you can verify that sooner rather than later. And you can change direction at any time. I know I'm repeating this, but I want to drive these points home. I mean, this is why we're an Agile shop, and this is the promise of Agile, and I, I think we're delivering on it. And so that's what we're up to now as a consultancy. Those are the techniques that we use and how they you know, enable testing and communication and saving dough. Anyone here still have to do waterfall methodologies? Wow, good. Uh, Jake says that they're wrong, and I, I tend to agree with him. 
Um, so the vision, which I've been building up to for the whole talk, is machine executable stories, machine executable English, and acceptance criteria. And, but before, before we get to that, we're going to talk about circuits. Circuits. Going to talk about impedance matching for maximum power transfer. <laughs> so, there's my awesome little circuit diagram. And maximum awesome. All right, I'm going to try to point at this for you. There's this notion, I know it's any stereophiles in the audience, they don't really do impedance matching, but when you buy speakers, you want the resistance of those speakers to match the resistance that's on your receiver so you can get maximum power to your speakers. Um, so the idea is you've got a voltage source in the left, that's that circle that's driving the circuit. And then that ZS there, that is the resistance or the impedance of the driver circuit. And then you got those two on the left here, you got these two ports, those are like the ports of your receiver or whatever. And now you got this ZL, this load here, and you want that resistance there, that little squiggly resistance to match that resistance. You want their, their number to be the same. Careful. So I'm going to try to make an analogy between this and bear with me. Clients are speaking one language. Developers are speaking another language. Code is yet another language itself, and then you could argue that the language of testing is its own mini language itself. We're going to try to match all these up. They all have a little bit different perspective, and the goal is to have maximum power transfer all the way from the customer's head all the way into actual running code down at the bottom. And they want to turn cash into code, and they want to maximize the value of their cash for that competitive edge that we've been talking about. Are there any electrical engineers in the audience, anyone with an electrical background training? All right, cut me some slack, because <laughs> I'm not sure this circuit's actually going to run. So uh, allow me, if you will, to blow your mind. This next transition actually almost breaks Keynote, so let's see what happens here. Yeah. <laughs> going to talk about impedance matching as it relates to getting ideas out of a client's head and onto you know, web servers. This is the worst circuit diagram ever. So you got your client on the left here. They speak English, and they're in blue. And you are the developer on the right in ruby red, and you're cool because you're on rails and you got your sunglasses on. All yeah, right, all right. So your client is the driver. You see in the lower left there that little dot. That's like a voltage source. So they're driving the process. They're driving it with money and interest, and they want something done. <laughs> they know what their problem is. They know what they want built. They can think in English and they can speak in English, but English is very resistant. It takes a lot of effort to express something in English, a lot more than it would take in code, or a lot more than it would take you in Geek to say the same thing. And we all know we're geeks, you know, we don't have maybe the social graces, we say things curtly and shortly and we, you know, offend people and whatever, but we get the point across. And so if you're a good geek, you can put your business analyst hat on and use your geek to English translator. And that's what helps you match up the rest of the resistance there. So it takes a little bit more to translate from geek to English. It takes more time. You've got to sit with your client. You've got to write story cards with them. <clears throat> but the whole point is you've now matched resistances there. And you can see those two on the top, the, two, the, the little dot and the little dot there. Those are the interface to the client. You've matched your impedance with the client. You've matched your resistance. You've got maximum power transfer going on right there. So you and your client are on the same page to the extent that you can translate from geek to English. But there's no code on the screen now. Let's try to write some code. Here is regular code that's very efficient, not very much resistance going on there. And it's probably the tightest, most expressive way to say what you want your system to do, because that's the thing that actually makes the system do what you want it to do. But who's ever written code that's failed or done not at all what they, what they expect it to do? How do we shore up that gap? Well, guess what's going to happen here? So th there's you. You're speaking geek. You've got two resistors. Let's add another resistor there for your MVC tests. So now you've got a little miniature circuit running here. This, just imagine this is you over here. You're just driving that little box there. You're driving that code. And they're matched up. So you've got what you think in your head as a geek is actually written in code and verified by MVC tests. So you, what was in your head is, is actually running, ideally. So here's, here's where we're going. You notice it's pretty empty in the upper right there. This is where integration tests come in. Integration tests take a lot more time to write. They're a lot more resistance because you're driving the browser or you're waiting for Firefox to run through some Selenium automated test suite, click your buttons or whatever. So the vision is 
you could use a tool like Cucumber, which allows you to express tests, integration level tests, in English to drive real code and take you all the way down the line, all the way around this circle. So here it comes. Let's see if we can make this happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now look at this. You've actually taken yourself out of the equation, ideally, or maybe some electrical engineers, and I can talk about this later. I think you've lowered the overall resistance of the circuit by giving it another path. Um, you can actually start from the lower left there, work your way all the way around, and your client can start expressing these integration tests in English because they can actually start to write these. So they're going all the way around the circle, keep going all the way around. Every once in a while, they might need you, so they come around and they go down your Geek to English translator, then you write some code, or maybe you help them write the integration tests. I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that. Let's just make it all go away. <laughs> Sorry if none of that made sense. I tried my best. And uh, I think something comes up. Is this what any of you are thinking right now? <laughs> so uh, in conclusion, speed metal. Anybody have any questions <laughs> about uh, any of the techniques we use or how to get testing in your organization or how to hire a hash rocket or whatever? I see the guy, not you, but one, his hand was up first. See me for drinks later. We'll talk about it. <laughs> um, but uh, a good answer for that is often if your pair is doing something dull, you can either research or spike the next thing. You're still sitting next to them, but you'll spike something that's difficult. You know, if you have if, anything that's low risk, if your pair is working on it and you're truly not interested, go spike something else or read a blog or whatever. But typically, that stuff goes really fast, especially in Rails. I think you were next. Uh, I was just going to make a small about oh, not speed metal slide. What's your programming use right now? Oh, it's whatever my pair will tolerate. <laughs> uh, we do this thing where we ping pong the music too. So, you know, you get one album is like Radiohead or something, and then the next will be, you know, metal if you can, if you can help it. Uh, so. Have you guys done, uh, tried pairing face to face across the table? You talk about, I've seen that rocking chair pairing too. Have you seen that one where the screen sharing? Uh, we haven't done that. I, I've, He's asking if we tried uh, pairing facing each other across the table. Is that your screen sharing for that, right? Yeah. Or you don't have any screen sharing. You can just have two monitors. Well, we, do, we just use a big ass 30 inch monitor. And I find that it helps you if you're both pointing at the same thing. You're like, oh, dude, look at that. There's something deeply ingrained with us. That you get that virtuality if you're not looking at the exact same screen. Because I've seen pairing situations where there'll be two screens side by side. And you're almost siloed on your own screen. just you happen to be sitting next to the person, it feels really weird. I've done it both ways, but ideally, yeah, you get a, you get a monster screen and you share it that way. You go front. You mentioned when you sit down with a customer, you always have a developer so you can establish uh, what the requirement is feasible or not. Um, how do you determine that threshold of, yeah, we can easily do this, or it might require some R&D, or that's not at all feasible? I mean, what if, what if that particular developer couldn't handle that task, but somebody else on the team could, but you might not know? All right, so the question, maybe I can re rephrase it, is uh, you're story carding with a client, and there's some doubt about the technical difficulty of the, of the problem. Right. I think what they would do, you probably just pretend there was no problem, or you say, oh, we can do that. It's just going to cost you. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it happens that way. I think we will just we will spec their intentions, but in the back of our mind, we'll be like, oh, no, this might be trouble. But really what's going to happen is we'll probably say, look, we haven't done anything quite like that before. We're going to have to do a spike on that. And at the very moment, they might actually write a chore in Tracker. So did that cover what you were getting at? Yeah, so we were afraid to be, like I said, very transparent. We'll just say, look, we don't have much expertise in that. It might have to spike on that, or we'll pull in some outside resources. So uh, moving uh, right next to him. How do you get a customer to reduce the scope of what they're asking for? No, come on. <laughs> uh, 
through honesty. That's the point of our story carding process. We actually had a customer, uh, David Cohn of Spot Us, that's spot.us. I'd like to give him a plug. It's community funded journalism. It's like microloans except for journalism. So he came in to us with a fully specced out, like almost at least a year, maybe two years worth of development. And he had high fidelity mockups ready to go. He had every little feature and he knew how it worked. We, we spent a week of like nine, 10 hour days talking through the system with him and we story carded like over 400 stories for this guy. And then, but by like day two or three, we're like, all right, there's a reality check coming. And so we told him right away, we're like, look dude, there's no way we're gonna do this in, in a month or, or whatever you want to do. And, since he was there and since he had gone through the pain with us, he was like, holy shit, this system does have to do a lot. And so he immediately started responding in an agile fashion. He's like, dude, what can I cut? What can I cut? And eventually he did. He cut most of his system out. And he was happy because we put out the true 1.0. A lot of customers will come to you with probably at least 3.0 of their system, maybe more like 5.0. And... You know, like, like we said, they, they wanted to have YouTube and Facebook features and LinkedIn and all that. And so we definitely pared them down. But what enabled us to do this was this arduous process of story carding. And we usually do it, we try to do it as a marathon in a week for the start of a new project. And we haven't had a customer come away who was like, that was worthless. They're all like, oh my God, I had no idea. So again, it's helping translate geek speak to the person who's asking for the system. They're like, wow, it does take a lot to make a website. When you're doing pair programming, people seem to be pretty attached to their editor's choice. Oh, make, are you asked uh, if people are religious about their editors, and you know, they, some people want to be in TextMate, some people want to be in Vim, some people want to be in Emacs, and the answer is we just say everyone has to use Vim because it's the best. <laughs> Uh, I think what, what happened for us is uh, a lot of times if someone was really a Vim head, uh, Tim Pope is on our team actually, he's the guy who wrote Rails.Vim, Hala, and uh, I think it, largely due to his influence, a lot of us were Vimmers actually from back in the day. I've been using Vim since high school, so some people weren't sold on Vim right away, so we would just run them both side by side or on top of each other. We would have Vim going and then we would have TextMate going at the same time and you just make sure to set them both up to auto load. And then, I mean, it definitely did lead to some arguments, but lately Vim has won out for us. I, I think we had a couple holdouts, and we, we still had a couple people on our team who didn't have iPhones. So as, as everyone eventually <laughs> purchased iPhones, they all switched to Vim, which is this kind of crazy dichotomy of like very old school and very glitzy UI new school. Keep them coming. Rob, um, for it, you had said that you go through this story carding process with the customers. So, I mean, when a customer comes to you in the first place, like with a book of spec, like how, what do you guys do to even estimate a project in the very beginning, before you can get to the whole story carding process? Because I'd love to see a client, like, like none of them write stories. Um, they just, again, they have this document, you know, 5.0, whatever, they want it all. How would I restate that in one sentence? So everyone can hear. What do you do when a client comes to you with a book of stories or a lot spec'd out or maybe they don't have it spec'd? How do we handle estimation, I guess is your question. Someone comes to you with some idea of functionality, maybe it's not fully fleshed out, how do we estimate? Um, I'm not totally in the sales end of it myself, but usually we can get them in the door for, for story carding and we'll go through that story carding week with them. And then by the end of that, They'll have some idea and we'll have some idea what really needs to be built or what can be built because they'll often come in with a budget because they'll have some VC money or they'll have some money they got from the bank or whatever and then we'll say, all right, we're not going to do fixed features, you know, we're going to do time and materials and this is what we think we can get done in three months. And it's almost always three months and we almost always burn through all their money. But uh, <laughs> it goes back goes back to this idea of getting everyone on the same page, and I've never seen a tool more powerful than, than stories for doing that and sitting and doing it together. Oh, Mr. Katz. Uh, you mentioned using the tracker. How do you do that? How do you have bugs? Oh, boy. He, he said, we, uh, we use Pivotal Tracker, and he's asking, how do we handle bugs? And you're talking about our whole process, probably, or whether we estimate them? Do you, do you uh, give them points? Uh, how do you... Uh, Funny you should ask, because we got our whole team in the living room yesterday and argued about this for over an hour. Um, <laughs> and we haven't been estimating them with points. 
Well, we've been, te we've been dealing with this as a people problem. So th there's two schools of thought. There's one that says, look, bugs and chores, consider them attacks on your project, and they will show up in your velocity. They will slow down your regular productive story making with points, and you'll see that, you know, instead of your velocity being 30 for the week, it was 20, and that's because you had some bugs and chores to do. And we've been okay with that, but we, we have been arguing about that because uh, Sandra and I just went through a whole week. He, he was my pair last week, and we did nothing but bugs and chores the entire week. So in Pivotal Tracker, we had zero velocity. So our average velocity went from 27 down to 12 <laughs> in just one week. And that's not a problem if you correctly manage your expectations with your client. But we definitely have some clients who love that number. They love seeing that velocity, and they want to see it fixed, or they want to see it keep going up. Or if it dips, they're like, I want my money back. You know, all our clients are agreeing. I'm kidding. Uh, and the other thing they see in Pivotal Tracker, though, that's affected by bugs and chores is this date. It will project out in your backlog um, when you can expect to see a certain feature by, because it knows how fast you work, it knows how many points are in your backlog, and it can say two or three weeks out you could expect to see these features. And some people, some clients treat that as a contract. So this, we argued about it and we decided it was a people problem and that you need to manage expectations that velocity is not destiny. That's a phrase we've been throwing out around. We also considered writing a grease monkey script or a bookmarklet that will hide the velocity number in Pivotal Tracker so our clients can't see it. But I have, I have one really good point to make and then we can refine your question. So we talked about the notion of the cone of probability and to the extent that you've got bugs or chores in your current iteration, you're going to be a lot fuzzier about any stories that are down the line because a bug could take a minute or it could take a day. And chores are a little bit more estimable. You know how long it takes to you know, back up your database or do something to that extent, refactor your schema in your database. But bugs, they could totally make your project spin out of control. You might hit a bug that stops you for two days, or like, I just hit one that stopped me for a day. And if a customer was expecting a certain story that was at the bottom of that iteration to be true at the end of the week, well, it's not. It's in the backlog now. Does that cover your... What are you doing? Are you using Tracker? Yeah. Or I don't have any questions. Yeah. Um, I guess if you... I guess if you have bugs and you also treat the velocity like a contract, then you're pretty like that's the deadly combination. Yes. So like if you like if you don't count the bugs as anything and you realize that they're going to factor into velocity in possibly unpredictable ways um, and treat the deadlines as kind of likely-ish. Probably the like the I like that one. <laughs> the lawyers are going to love that one. <laughs> the contractor, Hashrocket, will deliver software in a likely-ish time frame. Uh, so uh, we came down to it. Read this book, by the way. It's out of print, but you can get it on Amazon. It's called The Secrets of Consulting. And in the first couple of chapters, he'll basically say it's usually a people problem. So we were talking about this like it's a technology problem. Really, it's an expectations management problem on our end. And you could solve it either way. You could estimate your bugs or you could not estimate your bugs. But the point you got to get across to your customers is like, look, if there's bugs in this iteration, all bets are off. This iteration might totally flop. We're not going to get any new features. But what you're going to get is a stable system. But that doesn't happen very often, hopefully, if you're testing all the time and you're continuously integrated and you're really smart. <coughs> uh, um, with that, you said that sometimes you'll be deploying like multiple times during a week even or even during a day and some of your customers will like hop in there real quick and verify those stories. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen uh, on Obi's blog where he puts that, you know, the customer Basically, by contract, you have to have like a product owner um, named, and then they have to give you the time. But how do you get a customer that might be like not so into uh, being like in the day to day of their project to actually, yeah, you know, to verify anything even like once every two weeks? Yeah, or is that kind of like a criteria? Yeah, it's a people problem again. It's we have to we have to come back and renegotiate, so to speak, and say, look. To the extent that you aren't accepting these stories in a timely fashion, your project is going to assume risk and our idea of what the project is and yours are going to diverge and that's up to you to risk. But I mean, I've sent clients emails at 3 in the morning where, where I've yelled at them and said, accept your freaking stories because 
I can't deal with, with the stress level. And I want, ultimately, it's, it's for their benefit, right? Because if they're not accepting immediately, how do they know they're getting what they want? And how can we proceed as developers, possibly under false assumptions? We need those corrected almost daily. So <clears throat> the answer is escalation. I complain to Obi, and then Obi calls them, or Ben or Sal. But again, people problem. Was that, was that good enough? Yeah. I'm trying not to hide under the people problem. No, we can't do anything, but... Yeah, it usually comes down to that. Yeah. Anybody? I'll tell you anything. For free. Nothing. Is your shop big enough where you don't have We're a so new dude? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead again, I'm sorry. Is a hack rocket, obviously you have a lot of developers there. Do you keep the same pair throughout the entire topic? Um, ideally, no, because you get really sick of sitting next to the same guy all day. Love you, Sandro. <laughs> Sandro and I are actually roommates, so we're together all the time. It's great. Uh, that is a problem. We try to we try to encourage this notion of pair promiscuity, and we've been getting better at it because you want to mix. <laughs> This is, a great, this is a great industry we're in. But you, you know, as opposed to the real world, you actually want to mix and max your mental viruses as much as you can because there's this leveling up effect that happens on your team. If you've got, you got a superstar on your team, you want, you want him or her pairing with as much different people as possible. You know, I'm sure this, I could do a talk about genetics related to this. So <laughs> we try, though, you got to get some level of domain knowledge. So we try to keep a, a pair together for you know at least a month or probably the duration of the project. But then ideally, you're swapped out with a whole different pair. So you could expect to be with a pair for the duration of a project. And like I said, most of them are like three months. But the cool thing is, you can sort of ad hoc pull someone in at any time, and they'll sit down. Maybe you'll have a menage a whatever. I got to stop this. <laughs> but you got three, you know, three people on the same screen, and then so you got your original pairs learning from someone who's got some deep expertise. Because usually, like I, like I said, you can just yell over the wall. Does anybody know about this inane detail of, of our spec or whatever? And someone will have had that problem, and they'll come in, and, and then you got three people who know a little bit more about it. But I, I would love to switch more, especially because everyone gets project fatigue. You're on a project too long. You want out. You want fresh eyes on it. Um, so we try to do it every project. I'm getting waved at. No, I, it, it's a question. Aren't you the AV guy? <laughs> <laughs> Is this culture? Yeah, yeah. So does Pivotal help you to plan the release parties? Or is that just something you do around the office? I'm talking about like in this working in a remote distributed environment. You're asking if they help plan our release parties or, or if Pivotal supports like when a release happens or? Well, if you have the customer accepting these things, then um, I'm working with a remote team and they'll finish a, product, a, a feature and I want to review it before I tell the customer to accept it. Mm -hmm. So we want, it's like a two-step review. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, th there's no built-in facility. There's no built-in workflow in Pivotal Tracker that supports that. But often what we'll do is we'll leave all of our stories in a finished state. Um, uh, that's finished is the state right before deliver. And what we'll do is we'll leave them all unfinished, and then we'll do a deployment. We, we try to group them. And then before we click deliver, like that we don't solve with Tracker. We would solve that with, with Campfire or a phone call or whatever and say, look, it's the end of the day. We've all done a lot of features. We're all not sure what was developed today. Let's get, to, let's get our heads together. And that's usually just an ad hoc thing. But it's a, it's a good idea if you wanted to have one more step in the workflow. It, that's a case where technology could solve that people problem. You may have answered this two questions ago, but what do you do as far as preparing when someone's sick or on vacation? He's asking what do you do if someone's sick or on vacation? You know, if we pair, pair all the fucking time, you obviously need an even number of people. The cool answer for that is you should try to always hire an odd number of people with the bet that one of them is going to be sick at any one time. <laughs> then you shift. But, uh, uh, you know, like, like any company, we try to, you know, get our vacations planned ahead of time. And we'll see that coming as a resource issue ahead of time. So we have, you know, resource planning people like, like Sal. Sal would manage that or Ben. Or you can often say it's stand up. We do our company wide stand up in the morning and then we say, look, I, I don't have a pair today. Is anyone else missing missing a pair today? And then we can team up that way. 
And uh, you know, that's one of the advantages of, again, we have all these tests, we have uh, people who have swapped pairs. Anyone can pretty much jump into any project and they'll only be lacking the domain knowledge. But we at least have peripheral knowledge of every project that's going on. And you, you'll have that other pair, that pivot, as you will, or, or hinge, or whatever you want to call it, will have that domain knowledge. So it, it hasn't been a problem. I think we had one here before. You can't ask again. You run this thing. Talk to the guys. Go with you, and then we'll go over with you, and then I think there's someone else there. How many projects do you guys have going at any given time? Thousands. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I lose track of what works for us. We grew pretty fast, and I think there's 15 ish of us. Correct me if I'm wrong, people. And uh, obviously, we're trying for maximum utilization and billable time because we're a consultancy. So we'll, we'll have a handful at least. So you think in at least three or four, you know, ideally, your number of pairs divided by two, number of projects. Some projects will actually have four people on. So yeah, a handful. I would say six-ish less, depending on how the economy is going. We're doing great in that, right? Yes. Um, you said that you'll bring your clients in someday on the, like in a stand-up, I mean effectively like a stand-up. Um, do they, like, do you let them um, like chime in on those during the day? Or like even try and say, no, we don't like to call silence. <laughs> Ch chime in in what way, I'm sorry? I've heard different things where like product owner can be in the room, but during the daily stand-up where the you know, it's like, what did you do yesterday? Mm -hmm. or, or, yeah, what are you doing today? You know, what is getting in your way? Like during that kind of portion where, you know, product owner can't chime in, but then, you know, after that, I'll know. So he was asking, do we have any rules about whether a client or a certain type of client in a certain role, whether that's product manager or project manager, whatever terminology you want to use, I, a non-technical stakeholder, is that what you're getting at? And if they happen to be in the stand-up? Well, whoever like is signing their name on that contract, and you know they're the main point of contact for you, like that person. Oh, we definitely want them in, and they're. I mean, I said transparency. I mean, we mean it. We we have our clients in everything, and anyone wants to be in. We have both. Like we have, for example, we have a client who's also technical that we're actually pair programming with that client, and then they have a less technical stakeholder, and both of them will be in our stand-up calls and. It's fine. They just their eyes glaze over during the technical parts, and then then they move on. But yeah, we, we, we have no trouble with anyone coming in our. Some clients we even have you know on site in our office, and we just we do our regular thing. And you know you can tell I'm pretty candid. Sometimes we have to censor things, but uh, we we try to just be wide open and honest. That's that's what Agile's all about for us. Hey, number two. Um. With the uh, video you guys recently released at Vimeo, um, you kind of did the little like six minute video showing you guys pairing or anything. Is that something that you guys are trying to, um, in terms of the video stuff, are you going to be consistent with that or is that just kind of a one shot thing or is this something that, uh, you know, trying to demonstrate and show how you guys uh, function as a team? Okay, he's asking about the videos that are coming out from Hashrocket. We have a Vimeo channel, I think that's the official one, vimeo.com slash Hashrocket. You get to see me wearing a hat. And cracking my knuckles, and Sandro's in there too, and some other people, uh, Wes and Tim Pope are. Uh, we've been taking documentary video for like weeks now, and so we're in the production phase of that. And the whole idea is to give people a taste of what it's like to ac actually work and use these techniques every day. So in that video, you actually see in the room there, there, there's Sandro and me pairing, and then in the background there's another pair, in the background there's another pair. And the whole idea is to just show, show how, how we do it. And there's definitely more coming. Uh, we're trying to keep them intentionally with low production values right now, just because we, we want it to be raw. We just want you to see uh, candidly you know, what we're up to. And there's definitely more to come. It's just video editing takes a lot of time. and. Our documentary editor is currently flying down mountains in France with a parachute, so she'll be back soon. <laughs> More to come. Watch, watch our Twitter account for uh, updates. Anyone? Anyone? Wow, we almost filled all my time. Good thing I talked shortly. Uh, thanks again, and you know, buy me a free drink, and I'll talk and I'll argue with any of you about pair programming or any agile technique, because it's seriously, it's. It's made me so happy to finally do it right. And uh, thank you all. Thank Rails. Thank everyone. <laughs>